Uh, and my case study in the frame of this project is history of uh, congresses of Slavic journalists in Hatsum Slonavji and outside Bulgaria and Serbia. Uh, okay, so uh, the beginning of this history started 50 years after Slavic Congress, so the date is uh, symbolic. Um, and uh, first, I would like to show maybe some background uh, why uh, Poles, Czech, Croatians, Slovenians, Slovaks, uh, Russians, uh, Italians, I mean, wanted to cooperate together. Uh, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, the end of uh, Ivan Lin Coalition in uh, Imperial Council, uh, later, uh, uh, which was coalition of Slavs and Conservative uh, powers. In, in the parliament. Later we have a collapse of Kazimierz Badeni government. Uh, I will only remain that uh, Badeni was a Polish politician, uh, the prime minister of Austria, uh, who um, introduced uh, some uh, regulations, language regulations, very uh, positive for uh, Czechs, and it uh, provoked German um, society in uh, Vienna and of course in uh, also in the uh, Czech part of House of Monarchy, uh, to some um, propaganda, anti-Slavic, anti-Czech, and also anti-Polish propaganda. So this atmosphere was very tense this time. Uh, and we also have some examples of meeting of politicians uh, from different parts of Slavic, um, from Slavic parts of Monarchy. In 1997, we have Congress of Slavic Politicians in Krakow. Uh, but not only po uh, politic was something what was um, some some some, some key point. Uh, we see also cultural cooperation. Uh, for example, in 1890s, Czech representation was in Krakow when uh, Adam Mickiewicz ashes came from Paris to Royal Castle in Babel, and he was. Uh, then there was a second burial of, third burial of Mickiewicz uh, near royal tombs, Polish royal tombs, and uh, Czechs were also in Lwów, Lambert Lviv, uh, at the Congress of Polish writers. In Hungarian part, we have uh, maybe not similar, but also very important uh, moments, uh, events. Uh, of course, uh, we know about majorization policy in Hungarian. Uh, Part of monarchy and also in Croatia. Uh, but in 1896, there is millennium, 1000 years of Hungarian history, coming, Magyars ca are coming to Pannonia, and uh, Magyars are celebrating this big historical moment. But what about Serbs, Slovaks, Romanians, and Croatians in this big historical project? Of course, they are not main actors of this event, so they are meeting together and uh, talking about cooperations against majorization, against uh, Hungarian policy. Uh, so these congresses, uh, my topic, also a good uh, moment to invite them. Uh, and uh, maybe some facts from international history, which was which were important for uh, my journalists. Uh, as you see, 1896, there is a third international press congress. It was a huge, uh, huge, uh, huge event uh, in journalistic in press in 19th century, at the beginning of 20. The first congress was organized in Antwerp by International Union of Press Associations, and only a few popes were coming to these congresses. And what they discovered? They discovered that. Uh, there are not any Slavs, but there are 100 of Germans, there are a lot of Frenchmen, Italians. So they thought that maybe they will organize something similar in Habsburg monarchy, only with Slav participants. Um, so it was some idea, um, similar idea. And I need to mention that, uh, as you see, in Habsburg Monarchy, we have first uh, association uh, of journalists, Slavic journalists, first was um, in uh, Prague, 
uh, for Czech journalists, and the second one was in Lviv, and later was in Croatia, in Zagreb, and there, also, there were also smaller uh, associations. Uh, okay, and uh, David Koss, David Koss uh, in 1898, so after this event uh, which I showed, uh, we have 50 anniversary of SLAP Congress and 100 uh, anniversary of the birth of Santiszek Palacki. So it's a very good opportunity to organize something. And the Czechs organized uh, funding a uh, famous monument of Palacki in the center of Prague. They invited uh, guests from other parts of monarchy, especially from Galicia, I mean Poles, Ruthenians, and also the southern parts of monarchies, I mean uh, Croatia, Slovenia. Uh, they came to uh, Prague and there was a very huge, attractive program. The main point was laying the cornerstone for the construction of the monument and the hammer to beat the, this, this cornerstone was kept by Prince Lobkowicz, uh, Ladislav Riger, so it was contact, uh, ideological contact, but also uh, you know, he was uh, son of the law of Antiszek Palacki, so some spiritual and family contact between uh, generations. Godzimir Małachowski from Polish side, uh, president of uh, Lviv, uh, and Oleksandr Barowiński, Lutenian politicians. Uh, there was procession. Uh, Politicians, journalists uh, took part. There was the march of Prague City Guard uh, as close to the tradition of the Czech National Guard from 1848. The march of the Falcons, I mean Sokol, uh, Sokol organization. Uh, representatives of the guilds with banners tradi in traditional clothes. Actors and actresses dressed uh, in the costumes of historical persons, heroes from the Czech history. So there was Jan Zizka, there was uh, Jan Hus, there was Wandyszek Palacki, uh, and there was even cyclist, so it was very interesting. Uh, I have read about the illumination of the city in newspapers from this time, national park symbols. Uh, in all towns where train with Polish delegation were coming to Prague, people were singing songs, national uh, folk songs, uh, from Czech side, but also from the Polish side. And the last point was the first Congress <coughs> of Slavic journalists. Uh, I have found some illustration to show this celebration, this anniversary. Maybe it will be interesting for you. I found them in Svetlova Czech, Czech illustrating magazine newspaper. Uh, that's a ceremony of laying this colonel stone for the monument. Uh, as you see, there is a cavalero unit, so called. Uh, in this procession by in the street, a uh, march of Czech butchers in these white clothes, uh, people, no cyclists, but men <coughs> and women. So it was shocking uh, this time. Uh, each uh, Polish journalist this time was writing, and even cyclists, women cyclists, were coming <laughs> by the streets of Prague. Uh, modernization. Uh, okay, and there is a statue of uh, Palacki, figure of Palacki, uh, on a platform which was driving uh, by the uh, city. So you see how many people there were. I don't know how many, but Polish journalists were writing um, about 40,000 or 60,000, somebody about half a million, okay, Ale <laughs> we know that it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, and in the uh, theater uh, we see uh, living picture uh, homage to the Palacki. Unfortunately, this photo is very dark, so we cannot see the person, but maybe you see the scenography, uh, romantic style, and there is a white figure of Palacki as a ghost who came into the theater. Uh, and uh, you see uh, some people in uh, costumes, traditional costumes. Uh, and uh, okay, so uh, the last point of this big uh, celebration was the first Congress in Prague. It began history of subsequent Congresses. Uh, every year um, 
in another city of Habsburg monarchy. The first was in Prague, the second in Prague. The third should be in Zakopane or Zagreb. It was uh, impossible to organize in Hungarian part of monarchy this congress. Uh, so the third was in Dubrovnik, in Austrian part. Uh, later in Lublana, Pilsen, uh, Opatia Wołosko. Touristic, <laughs> touristic congress. Ukraińska uh, Kratyszka, Lublana, uh, and uh, two were organized outside of Habsburg Monarch in Sofia and Belgrade, and the last one in Prague. Okay, goals of congresses. Uh, the first was integration of the journalistic community from different Slavic nationalities, striving uh, for direct exchange of information. Uh, um, they wanted to uh, transfer information without uh, Vienna, uh, uh, German uh, correspondence office in Vienna. They wanted to create our Slavic correspondence office. Uh, so they wanted also to create a Slavic newsletter or some bulletin. There was a problem in which language, which language would be common for all Slavs. Czechs, Polish, Russians, uh, German, that also will <laughs> be one concept, uh, and establishment of the Union of Slavic Journalists, or a Union of Association of Slavic Journalists, to cooperate together in all Slavic countries of Habsburg monarchy and uh, help each other to send uh, objective information about relationships between Czechs and Germans. Slovak and Magyars, and other uh, topic. Minor goals supporting the development of Slavic press, promoting economic development, etc. Ah, and of <coughs> course, counteracting the internal expansion of the German economy in economy and in propaganda. Uh, okay, but uh, they, uh, um, that was the idea. But when they met together, when they discovered each other, uh, they, when they were consulting together, they uh, discovered a lot of problems between each other. Uh, for example, the main problem was uh, Polish-Russian conflict versus Russophilism. Poles were against Russian participation in this Congress, for example. Some part of Czech politicians or journalists wanted to invite Russians to this Congress, and also some uh, uh, other nationalities wanted uh, it too. Uh, the second problem was obstruction of the participation of Slovaks in the congresses by Hungarian uh, and later Austrian authorities. Uh, it was the big problem for Polish uh, journalists and politicians. Why? Because, as you know, we have Polish-Hungarian brotherhood uh, tradition and uh, Slovak were stopped by the Hungarian uh, government as citizenship, citizens of uh, Hungarian part of Hungary. Uh, there was also Croatian self conflict and Polish Ukrainian, uh, I mean, this time I used the, uh, this word Ukrainian uh, antagonism, especially it was visible at the Second Congress in Krakow. Okay, maybe some illustration which. Uh, Two illustrations which show uh, very uh, satirically, fun, uh, it's maybe a little funny. Uh, th th this, these conflicts were illustrated but, uh, by satirical newspapers. Uh, that's a history from the first Congress in Prague. Uh, as you see, Polish delegation, they, are, uh, <coughs> they have close traditional Polish uh, gentry uh, clothes. They wanted to show us Polish gentry. And uh, you see, uh, Russian um, delegation in the in the center there is Bizarion Komarov. It was a general uh, Russian general. He was fighting in the seventies uh, in, uh, at the Balkans, uh, and uh, two professors from the Warsaw University. Warsaw University this time was Russificated. So it was very big problem for Polish delegation. Why Russificators are in track? Uh, I don't, they, they didn't want to uh, contact together. When Russians came, Poles were going out. <laughs> but one meeting was common. 
it was party, banquet, <laughs> at Sofin Palace, in fact, uh, at the uh, Tava River. They met together uh, after drink. Uh, Komarov said that it's a big struggle, Slavs against Germans. This is a moment when Slavs are fighting together against Germans like uh, five. Uh, six uh, hundred years ago at the Battle of Grunwald, Tannenberg, when Polish and Lithuanian corps uh, struggled with Teutonic Order. Uh, one of Polish journalists who drank too much uh, and he didn't understand this, uh, this speech, uh, thought that it is some kind of finding uh, cooperation maybe they want to make some peaceful contacts and they uh, get toast for this command of Polish press said that he is a traitor of Polish nation and you see this illustration this Polish journalist is touching together with this command and you see there is this uh, picture there is Murat Wieszatyl, uh, that was governor of Lithuania uh, after, uh, during the Polish uprising, general uprising in 1863. He murdered a lot of Polish uh, patriots, uh, soldiers, he smiling, laughing that, that this idea uh, of cooperation, uh, he's laughing of this idea of cooperation. Of course, for them it was one Slavic possibility, possibility to to organize pan idea projects. And the second illustration shows the second congress in Krakow. Uh, there was a problem because uh, Poles uh, invited Slovaks. Uh, but Hungarians didn't give, uh, they didn't give uh, permissions to come uh, to, to, to Krakow. And, uh, but Polish uh, organizers said, but they are in train. OK, so they can come to Krakow, but they cannot uh, talk. So you see this uh, Slovak, Slovak uh, journalist uh, with mouth, which are uh, <laughs> uh, <in those laughs> mouth, yes, when he is going to track. Okay, and results of congresses. Uh, we can talk about uh, cooperation, uh, some contacts, uh, tribal and professional contacts. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, two uh, very important magazines. Uh, I, I don't want to say that the direct uh, result of congresses. But participants of these congresses were publishing their articles in Slovanski Przeklad and Szkarskowiański. Uh, Slovanski Przeklad out of Czerny was a leader. He was the, one of the most important uh, future uh, organizer uh, of the first congress and the famous connection, famous Polish uh, Slovianophil. And we have Slovianski Club in Krakow, Slovianski in Krakow with Marian Zdziechowski. Marian Zdziechowski, uh, famous philologist who was talking in many languages, was a participant of uh, the most of these congresses. And the most important success of this moment, of, of this cooperation, was the creating the Union of Slavic Journalists in 1903. But this contact, uh, where, uh, but this, uh, this idea uh, collapsed when? In 1908, because in Ljubljana, uh, where was the biggest congress, 1,000 journalists, uh, there was also big representation of Russia. And Paul said, never more, we will not come to next congresses. And in Bulgaria and Serbia, journalistic congresses were organized together with Neo-Slavic congresses. OK, so uh, thank you for uh, attention. So the Neo Slavic context will be the topic of the next um, of the, of the next paper given by Frank Harwa. Frank Harwa is historian, research and research coordinator at uh, the Center of History and Culture uh, of Eastern Europe at the Leipzig uh, University. Um, and the Leibniz Institute. Don't mix it up. 
Uh, he's connected with Leipzig University, but as guest professor and researcher, he was also active at different universities and institutes in North America, North America, South Africa, East Asia, and of course Europe. He is general secretary of the Commission Internationale des Études Historiques Lab, and he's co-chair of the German, Czech, Slovak historians. The two of us. Yes, I have to check one, <laughs> German one. Uh, so, <laughs> so you have the mic. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it's always good to see at the end of a conference a pretty much filled up room, yeah. which is which is the proof that the choreography of the conference was good. And especially that I'm speaking after you, because you had half a century, I go on a few years, six decades, and I come back to Prague. And this is what you see here. And I'm going to talk about Neo-Slavism, which was a very short-lived phenomenon of non-governmental foreign policy in Central <coughs> Eastern and Southeastern Europe on the eve of First World War. neo slavism appeared in 1906, so immediately after that, what you have been talking about, reached its peak with the neo slav Congress held here in Prague in summer 1908, and disappeared after the next Congress organized in Sofia in 1910. neo slavism was an attempt of a few enthusiasts to bridge the Catholic Kaiser Troy Austroslavism, we have been talking about it last days, and Orthodox Russia oriented Pan Slavism, we have been talking about it. The idea of Neo Slavism can be defined, and I would try to do it, as a melange of A, international relations between states, Austria Hungary, Russia, Serbia, Bulgaria, B, politics of national emancipation within states, the Poles, the Czechs, the Croats, and the Slovenes, and C, transnational individual activities of national agents like the Czech Karel Kramaj, the Hrvat, the Croat, Ivan Hribar, the Galician Russophile, Ukrainian Mikulash Plebovitsky, or the Russian Svetovsky. All of them under the auspices of the antebellum imperialism left their own more or less narrow national containers to be replaced by a wider Slavic container, which proved to be, yes, still national, but also transnational at the same time. In search for an answer, ladies and gentlemen, why the Neo-Slavism gained importance in the very year of 1906, I developed the hypothesis that Neo-Slavism cannot be interpreted only as a regional phenomenon coming from within Central and Eastern Europe, but also as a product of an interconnected and tangled processes going beyond Europe, being affected by the change of global power relations in arms. This observation I'm going to explain in the first part of my talk. The second part, I will reconstruct the initial steps made towards Neo-Slavism. The third part is devoted to the immediate planning and preparation of the Prague Congress held in July 08, and the last part deals with the Congress itself. So my first part, the interconnectedness of Neo-Slavism with the change in global power relations. In 1905, ladies and gentlemen, Russia was a war against Japan. This unexpected defeat in the sometimes in the sometimes for good reason called World War Zero was a meditative because which caused a revolution in Russia's internal policy, manifested by the shaping of the parliament of Duma and leading to a constitutional monarchy. The lost war, on the other hand, caused a reorientation of Russia's foreign policy from the Far East back towards to the Near East, 
leading to what was called by contemporaries a return of Russia to Europe. The portal of Russia's new orientation towards Europe after 1905 was the Balkans. And this peninsula, in the meantime, however, had become a playground of expansionist endeavors of the later central powers. Faced with the engagement of Austria-Hungary on the Balkans, seen as an active support of the German Drang nach Osten, the Western Slavs considered themselves most effective. Political aspirations arose to renew connect connections with Russia beyond the old pan-Slav creed of one language, one religion, one rule to be replaced by the principle of political solidarity of all Slav peoples based on their cultural equality. No doubt the slogan, no one is a Slav who oppresses Slavs, was popular among Austrian Slavs. In the Russian Empire, such a slogan sounded totally different because there existed a, a whole set of multiple Slav, Slav oppressions. Poles, other the Russians, Ukrainians, other the Poles. First voices calling in Russia, in Russia itself, for a reconciliation in the relationship with the, uh, among the Slavs could have been recorded right after the military defeat in the Far East. The progressive, but not governmental journal Ras uh, Raskaya in 06, in spring, brought an article stating, and I quote, with the breakup of the bureaucratic Russia in the Manchurian fields, unconditionally disappeared the pan-Slavism from the political scene. The idea of an all-Slavic solidarity, of an unification of all Slav tribes into one cultural ensemble is developing. And the new Russia, all Slavs in this new Russia, all Slavs from the Poles, to the Czechs and the Bulgarians can find a bulwark against attacks to their national cultures. Russia is, Russia is confronted with the colossal, uh, colossal task to unify the entire Slavic East under the rule of the Slavic Union, based by no means on violence or oppression, but on cultural accords. It was kind of accomplished the leader, one of the leaders of the young Czech, Czech representation in those years, who later became the president, if not the hero of the Prague New Slav Congress, who realized the new situation on the Russian side after the Japanese adventure. He welcomed the fact that the Slavic feelings of Russia were being reborn out of the humiliation suffered on the far eastern battlefields. I quote him. The heavy trails of a lost war and the revolution have taught Russia to, to view serious existing realities. They have brought about the realization that no longer is it possible to treat with contempt the sympathy offered by the others. <coughs> Russia has learned that, on the contrary, their support is essential in order to avoid isolation in the sea of enemies. And with regard to the change condition in the great power relations, Kramarsh added, and I quote him again, the Slavs do not wish to set at Varian's the two, the two largest Slav dominions, Russia and Austria. On the contrary, they are endeavoring to make it possible for the two states to live in peace and jointly defend themselves against the common enemy. Guess who? The German Kaiser. Second, first steps out of which Negro Slav movement started to grow. In early 1906, the Russian journalist in Vienna, Severod Svatkovsky, wrote a series of articles in, with the title L'Union Slav published under the telling pseudonym Nestor in a review Slav. He described the danger of an eastward expansion of Germany, which effectively could be stopped only 
by a united Slav approach, no longer based, no longer based on the old principle of Panslavism that means the Russian domination, but on the basis, in, in, uh, on the basis of equality of all Slavic nations. Swarkovsky believed that the Slavs should initiate closer ties among themselves by organizing mutual visits, exchange congresses, and by increasing commercial contacts, including the Custom Union of Russia and the Hapkopoli. This is hooking on what you have As a parallel action, he in Prague, the Czech literary journal My, in spring of the very year, was saying, launched a survey of opinion concerning the future Slavic policy, including the question whether the United Slav movement within the Russian peace of Austria was possible beyond the old Austria, Austro-Slavism. Among the over 30 answers sent in was one by the Croat deputy of the Vienna Reichsrat, Ivan Hriba. He proposed three fields of Slav-Slav cooperation. First, in politics, limited to the Austrian half of the monarchy, based on the United Slav parliamentary organization in the Viennese Reichstag. Second, in economics including both halves of the monarchy based on a union of Slav financial institutions, third in country, going beyond the double monarchy, based on concerted action of organizations aiming to increase the national awareness of, the, of all the particular nations. As a result of the survey, uh, the additional report <coughs> asked the Czech National Council to discuss the idea to organize an open, a Congress of Slav nations to commemorate the Slav Congress we are talking about. My third point, the immediate preparation of the Prague Congress. In late November 07, a meeting of Slav members of the Reichsrat took place in Vienna. Present were representatives of all Slavic Völkerschaften except for Karel Ramaj took the opportunity to outline his views. He stressed, and this is important now, that any new Slav movement must reject the old pan-Slavic principles of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, and replace them by the democratic principles of freedom, equality, and prosperity. In Novoye Vremia, was spread the idea for such a congress to be organized preferably in St. Petersburg, aiming to stimulate interest in the Western Slavs among the Russians and to indicate, indicate to the world that despite the disastrous outcome of the recent Russo-Japanese war in the Far East, the Slavs remain strong. In Russia itself, new organizations have been shaped, like the Objects for Slavyansko Nauki in April of 08. Even before in March, the Association of Public Figures debated the issue of future Slav Congress. One of the leading representatives, Vladimir Volodymyrov, traveled to Prague and Vienna and handed over an invitation to the leaders of the Austrian Slavs to visit St. Petersburg. A delegation consisting of three members of the parliament, Karamash, Rima, and Kerbovitsky, I mentioned it in the beginning, left for Russia in late May. They did so with the approval of the Austrian-Hungarian foreign minister, Erdogan, who stated afterwards, and I quote him, the attempt to unite the Slavs could favorably affect relations between Austria-Hungary and Russia. It is not, as to quote, it is not impossible that neo-Slavism could benefit our aims in the Balkans. My first point, new Slavism, neo-Slavism in action and the firework of plans and declarations. The first neo-Slav Congress was opened on July 13th, 08, in the council chamber of the old town hall in Prague. It was Karabash, my first slide. It is his, uh, signed by himself for Kramash, being registered, uh, to give the main speech to altogether uh, 83 delegates. 
have been welcomed by the mayor of Queens, using Czech, Slovenian, Serbo-Croat, Bulgarian, Polish, and Russian languages. Kramer addressed each of the delegations, and to the non-present German Poles, as they were called, in Slovak and the Lusatian Serbs, he sent his sincere greetings. The agenda for the next days, three days, consisted of a wide range of subjects. Most important for the Czech side was no doubt economic matters, like the plan to shape a Slav or Slavic bank and to prepare Slavic industrial exhibitions. The plan, which initially was made in 1901 for an ethnographic and artistic show in St. Petersburg, but due to the Russian, also Japanese war in Iraq. The interest for the, from the Czech side was quite high to combine the original cultural focus with an economic section. Scheduled in Prague for Moscow between 1911 and 15 at the latest, the Russian reaction in Prague was not unfavorable. One of the delegates stated, and I quote him, and please listen carefully, to familiarize us, that means the Russians, with Slav industrial production and enable us to discover in which fields successful competition is possible with German, English, and even up to a point with American products, have in mind that the peace of the Russo-Japanese war was signed well in the narrative. For the first time, a European war was finished in America. Change the global Concerning the cultural and educational cooperation, there have been discussed a Prague plan sounding like the early days of the European Union. Exchange of scientific and technological know how exchange of scholars and students, exchange of books, creation of joint energies for journalists and sportsmen, and fostering tourism. The Prague firework, ladies and gentlemen, of plans and declarations, in fact, remain, as the Russian observer put it, as a true firework. And the British diplomat noted it was, they quoted it, nevertheless, a great theatral, theatral exhibition of Slav solidarity. And it proved to be, in fact, the solidarity itself which at once became a challenge and a touchstone for the neo-Slav movement when Austria Hungary, a few months after the Prague Congress, occupied Bosnia and Herzegovina in October 08. The Slav deputies of the Reichstag, including Kramer and his comrades, approved the invasion, while the official Russia protested. <coughs> Under that condition, the dream of neo Slavism lasted, in fact, only one summer. To sum up, seen in the global perspective of the neo Slav movement, belong to a worldwide process of transnationalism around 1900, which was marked by the practice of world exhibitions, the springtime of world congresses organized by world organizations. In addition, neo Slavism is also to be seen as a direct relation to the outcome of the Russo-Japanese war, which for good reasons, and I mentioned that, more and more is called a war. However, the phenomenon I have been talking about was limited to the Slavic war. The number of materialized results out of the neo Slav Congress remain very limited. You may not have heard about Prague. Only one declaration in the letter to the, to the king was not easy. One of the, of the was that book, which you see standing in my office in Leipzig, uh, entitled Slovansborg, and published here in Prague in 1912. I, was, I, I wanted to bring it in, but it was too heavy. It's a Spalle, this piece. <laughs> And, and, and it was it was made by 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 Bidloch, who was mentioned by Stefan Lea. Yeah. So, on on altogether 777 pages, that draws what Kramarsch 
in the foreword said, a picture, I quote, of all we call Slovansko. Its political and religious history, its cultural progress, <coughs> and spiritual uh, material desires. As you see, the volume presented Czechs, Slovaks, Russians and Serbs, Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, Belarusians, Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs and Bulgars, Bulgars, and their position on fields like arts, music, see, there's a chapter by Stanley Mayer, journalism, we just have been talking about sports and humanism. And ladies and gentlemen, this impressive volume includes at the very end an impressive man. Mapa Slovanstva. So the map of the Slavic world, which itself would deserve a separate paper. Not only, but also due to the fact that the Polaps, the Slovana, Slavs along the Elbe River are depicted with the information that they have died out which brought them in, because we have had panels on Slavic archaeology, and they were active there, in the Northwest. Very small. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. And now let me introduce the last Jan Schubski, yeah. historian, associate professor, professor of, at the Birkenmeier Institute for the History of Science and the Polish Academy of Sciences. He researched his research. Uh, interests are the history of Central and Eastern Europe during the 20th century. So the Soviet Union, Soviet Polish relations, and again this background, you can also see this uh, the, 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 the title and the topic, the, the subject of the of the paper, had been form, uh, formulated, chosen, Marxist synthesis of the history of Slavic countries in the Eastern Bloc and in the USSR. I or maybe I uh, would also mention our last book about the history uh, about. Um, about the Soviet policy and the historiography and uh, historical research in, uh, in, in Poland. So, but the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you for the short introduction. Uh, last but not least, I hope, and, uh, taking to in, taking into account that uh, most of us are tired a little bit, and we had a. Uh, Beautiful uh, Friday, uh, Friday evening. Uh, I'll try to be uh, short in my and brief in my uh, speech, and uh, I'm going to concentrate on uh, several uh, key points uh, regarding my uh, presentation. So, first of all, uh, I'd like to start with the mm, some. Uh, mm, misunderstanding which is connected with the uh, term uh, Slavic studies in Russian and especially in uh, Soviet meaning. It is worth noting here that the term Slavic studies, Slavia in Russian and particularly in Soviet understanding was not limited to working on the Slavic literature and languages but it also covered a much wide, uh, wider scope including research on historical, uh, social, and uh, economic studies. Uh, when Bolsheviks uh, seized, uh, when Bolsheviks uh, came to power, uh, research on history, uh, culture, and um, uh, Slavic languages uh, enjoyed uh, little popularity. The priority was given to the concept of internationalism, uh, which was particularly popular in the uh, early post-revolutionary revolutionary years. The Stalinist repressions from the early 1930s aimed at the old school elites 
including the Slavist case, has caused the collapse of the Slavic studies uh, as the field of the research. The Institute of Slavic Studies, uh, which was established in Leningrad in, in 1931, uh, whose prerogative was, I quote, to carry out comprehensive research on history, economy, linguistics, and material culture of Slavic nations on the basis of materialistic methodology, was liquidated in 1934. The older generation of Slavic, of Slavic uh, scholars, such as Mikhail Spiransky, Vladimir Pieritz, were sentenced under false uh, allegations, deprived of their titles and degrees, and finally exiled to the uh, distant uh, part of the USSR. In the second half of the uh, 1930s, the Stalinist type of Marxist-Stalinist concept of understanding I would say the process of history was solidified in the Soviet uh, science, in the Soviet humanities. Justification of the multinational character of the Soviet Union was, apart from uh, determining the dogmas of historical formation, one of the most uh, substantial issues. The idea of great and friendly family of the USSR's nations, promoted, promoted by the Soviets, required uh, scientific validation for the uh, country's uh, joint fates, first and foremost, the Slavic ones. Uh, to meet the demands, the Marxist-Leninist historiographic concept of the Stalinist type, pre-revolutionary uh, Russian <coughs> historians adapted and formulated to this on the, I would say, Rufanian uh, identity, uh, Ruskaya or uh, Stara Ruskaya uh, uh, in the Russian language uh, of the Ukrainian and Belarusian territories with its roots in the era of Kiev and Rus and the constant aspiration of Ukrainians, Malarusi, and Belarusians, Belarusi, to merge with the uh, Russians, uh, Rusi. In 1939, the Nikolai Mar Institute for, of Material Culture History appointed a special team to research the Eastern Slavic ethnogenesis, ethnogenesis. Recognizing Kiev and Rus as a cradle of the mm, common uh, state, so-called Ruthenian Commonwealth, became a rationale for identifying the Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians as integral parts of the Ruthenian nation. A concept of a common origin of the Eastern uh, Slavs as a part of Ruthenian nation established solid foundation for the concept of the one of the of the on, of the one and only nation in the political sense. At the dawn of the out outbreak of the Second World War, not only were the scientific foundation for the uh, brotherhood uh, of three nations formed, but they were also established in the Soviet history and education by publishing uh, a series of textbooks. The change of geopolitical priorities in Moscow in spring 1939 resulted in revising the Kremlin's uh, attitudes to research of the history of Slavic, Central and East European countries. Uh, in, uh, in spring 1939, a new section of Slavic studies was created within the structure of Historical Institute of the USSR Academy of Sciences. On April 21, uh, 1939, the uh, newspaper, the publishing organ of the USSR highest leg legislative body, published an article by Vladimir Picheta in which the author argued on the necessity to study both the Slavic history and the Russian history on the basis of the uh, Marxist uh, methodology. The above-mentioned representative of the younger generation of historian, Vladimir Picheta, who had received his education and academic degrees at the fall of the Russian Empire, started in June 1939 a project to create the Marxist history of Poland. On May 11, 1939, the chair of South and Western Slavic history was formed within, within the Department of History of Moscow State University, MGU, MGU in Russian. During the German-Soviet War, 
uh, in 1941-1945, explosion of Slavic themes uh, provided an additional factor cementing the family of the USSR uh, nations. The concept of new Slavic movement, uh, extensively exploited by the propaganda, needed a scientifically proven confirmation of historical unity of Slavic faiths and academic authorities uh, whose research were to confirm Russian and Soviet historical mission to unite all Slavs under their leadership. Thus, this emerged a need for an academic center to gather, to gather all such people. This was the ground for the imperial interest of the Soviet country to concur with aspiration uh, of the academic milieu, which dealt with the general issues of the Slavic uh, countries. Uh, here on this picture, uh, you can see the uh, residence of the uh, Soviet, now uh, Russian Academy of uh, Scientific, uh, Sciences uh, Authorities. Uh, organization works uh, on establishing the USSR uh, Academy of Scientists Institute for Slavic Studies were finalized by the decision, decision of the Central Committee, All Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, uh, on August uh, 31st, 1946. Boris Grekov, who was a historian of Kiev and Rus, uh, was appointed uh, the director of the institute, and uh, Vladimir Pichatov, uh, who specialized in the history of uh, Ruthenian uh, um, territories within the uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So Vladimir Pichata was appointed as a, a, a vice and director. The Institute uh, of Slavic Studies was attentively observed by the uh, Communist Party. Moscow needed immediate academic works to meet the current political demands. And uh, here I, can, uh, I have to uh, point that uh, uh, most of the historians and uh, politologists uh, often use the terms uh, such as Moscow and Kremlin uh, uh, in the meaning the uh, uh, Soviet and Moscow uh, rulers. But in fact, the uh, decision-making process uh, was taken uh, on the uh, uh, Stara Square, on the Stara Plosheth, which is not far from Kremlin, which is, I would say, it's a uh, walking distance uh, to the uh, Spaskaya uh, Gate. And uh, here, it, at this building, for a long time, I mean, from the early 90s uh, until the, uh, 2015, uh, the uh, Russian uh, archives of the contemporary history uh, was uh, situated. But coming back to the, uh, in the current topic, management of the historical scientists in Kremlin was highly centralized. Issues related to the uh, scholarship, especially the humanities, uh, humanities were within the sphere of interest of the Department of Agitation and uh, Propaganda, which was established in 1947. Um, the, um, and uh, after several uh, reorganization, which took place in the 50s, uh, department of, separate Department of Science was created. Uh, it was a complicated process because the uh, uh, um, uh, Department of Science was combined uh, with the uh, issues uh, connected to the culture, the next step with the issues connected with the higher educational institution. And uh, uh, maybe uh, it's, uh, uh, it is necessary to uh, answer a question, uh, who made the decision on uh, specific uh, issues? Usually, the governing bodies, the secretariat, and the political bureau was entrusted with the development of individual cases to correspond to the department of the central uh, committee, which often used expert uh, assistant. And uh, we have a short talk with one of my colleagues uh, regarding to the Udalsov case. Uh, Ivan Udalsov was one of the experts, and then he uh, he was served as a uh, as a uh, uh, vice, uh, vice uh, director of the Department of the Ideology uh, within the Central Committee uh, of the uh, Central Committee uh, Communist uh, Party of the Soviet uh, Union. 
with the help of the wide branch bureaucratic apparatus, the ruling party state elites managed to initiate, coordinate, and monitor scientific research and popularization in the in the field of historical science or in the field of humanities. The necessity to create a relevant handbook based on the Marxist methodology was not exclusively conditioned by aspiration of the party historians to own a historical fantasies which would represent the materialistic view on the history. It was an issue of national significance, constantly supervised by a higher notables of the communist, uh, Soviet Communist Party. The newly formed Institute for Slavic Studies was to write as quickly as possible a Marxist synthesis of history of individual Slavic countries, such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Bulgaria. Works on history of Yugoslavia were uh, disrupted in 1948 due to a conflict between Stalin and Josip Broz Tito, and the following exclusion of Yugoslavia from the sphere of the Soviet uh, influence. Meanwhile, uh, in the regional centers in Minsk and Kyiv, works were underway to create and approve by the party uh, Marxist approach of two other united uh, Eastern European nations, the Ukrainians and the Russians, uh, uh, were taken. At the beginning of the uh, 1950s, uh, in the within the Institute of the Slavic uh, Studies, works on the draft of the uh, volume one of the history of Poland were at the most advanced stage. At the same time, works on the Marxist synthesis of the history of other Slavic countries, Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia, were in progress. The three volume Soviet history of Poland was written in the years 1954-1958. Uh, volume, uh, the, the first uh, volume of the history of Bulgaria was published in 1954 by the USSR Academy of Science Publishing House in the volume of uh, 2000 copies, edited by Piotr Tetsiakov, Sergei Nikitin, and Lubomir Vat. In the introduction to volume one, the authors placed sentences such as, I quote, the authors of the volume present this central long friendship between the Bulgarian nation and the great nation of Russia, as well as a strong, deep cultural, economic, and political connections. The author's task was to reveal the progressive and liberating role of Russian nation in Bulgaria's historical course, especially the rule of the great socialist, socialist October Revolution, which had opened the new era in the history of humanity. On the other hand, the three-volume Soviet History of Czechoslovakia was published with a two-year delay against the handbook on the history of Poland in the years 1956-1960. The editors of the volume noted that working on the history of Slovakia and the lack of sources had caused the greatest difficulties, and they blamed it on the bourgeoisie historians. The two-volume history of Yugoslavia was brought to light at, as late as 1963. Stalin's death triggered a gradual normalization with the Soviet-Yugoslavian relations, which led to clearing contacts between the two countries. Political changes in the years 1955 to 1956 uh, had enabled the recovery of the works on the Soviet history of Yugoslavia. Notably, opposite to the other Soviet approaches of, of the, to the history of Slavic countries, where the final censorship was marked by the middle of the uh, 1950s, the history of Yugoslavia had only been presented until November 1945, and didn't indulge, and didn't, uh, indulge in the Soviet-Yugoslavian conflict. Finally, a few, finally, a few words on the history handbooks of the Eastern Slavic countries, the Belarusian and the Ukrainians. Volume 1, the history of Belarusian SRR, edited in cooperation with Moscow historians, was published in Minsk in 1954. The concept of the Belarusian history, prepared in the years 1943 to 1958, collected in a two-volume handbook, Habener to be surprisingly 
lasting and its particular interpretation and official models had permanently settled into the official, I stressed official, Belarusian historiographic, historiographic uh, canon and uh, the national ideology. The formulation of the Marxist approach to the history of Ukraine provided to be more problematic. Volume 1, after multiple corrections and supplementation at the beginning of the 1950s, mainly due to the necessity to allow for Joseph Stalin's work, was approved for print at the end of the 1953 and appeared in bookstores in spring 1954, receiving a prize from the party official in Moscow and Kiev. Volume the second was revealed in 1956. And let me proceed to the conclusion. The permanent supervision of the relevant offices of CCCPSU was the measure for the importance and significance of the Soviet project to create the canonic approach to the history of Slavic countries, joined by a single conceptual thread. The scientific patronage over the project was appointed by the party, Institute for the Slavic Studies, which in the 1950s of the 20th century forged concepts and framework for the fair of the Slavic countries. Hence, the conclusion that those actions had been inspired and realized in agreement with the interest of the, both the country and the Soviet uh, Communist Party and uh, comprised one of the most significant elements of its, I would say, historical policy. Looking from the broad perspective at attempts carried out in the uh, 1950s to impose the Soviet historical model on each East Bloc country, a conclusion can be drawn that besides class determinism, the central pivot of the narrative uh, is the conviction of the superiority or even progressiveness of everything to be Soviet <coughs> over the West. West. <coughs> this approach is particularly visible in the history handbooks uh, of the Soviet <coughs> countries, I mean Ukraine and Bel Belarus, where the central narrative pivot, pivot was the conviction of the uh, Ukrainian and Belarusian territories to have belonged to the ancient Orthodox Eastern state uh, uh, Slavic uh, civilization with the Catholic West as the natural and long-time enemy. The 19th century Russian, imperial Russian concept of constant pursuit of the Ukrainians and Belarusians to join the Russians was adapted in the Ukrainian and Belarusian handbook in the version suited to the requirements of the Marxist methodology and the Soviet ideology, first of all, and uh, binding during the times of the USSR. And the last one. In the span of the last few years, renaissance of the Soviet models and interpretation approaches have been observed. The thesis that Ukraine and Belarus origin in the Orthodox Eastern Slavic civilization, and as such cannot exist beyond the civilization space of the Russian world, so-called Ruskimir, has been the central pivot of the reanimated and modernized modernized uh, narration. The historical concept of the Slavic Commonwealth present in the Soviet propaganda has been remodeled into the Orthodox Ruthenian civilization enriched with the experience, the times of the USSR. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention during this long vlog. It is still not ending because I think we can afford several minutes of discussion. Questions are coming, please. Okay. Uh, okay. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, two observations that I would like to make. First of all, uh, you know, to Frank's excellent paper, just to, to add that uh, the uh, uh, shift between, uh, uh, or I should say, from Pan-Slavism to Neo-Slavism uh, that he uh, talked about at some point, uh, was a result of also, among other things, the uh, deep shift 
inside the Russian uh, industrial bourgeoisie, particularly in Moscow, between the uh, cadet parties led by Guchkov and the new progressivist party, which was uh, led by the Yabushinsky brothers and Konovalov, among others. I won't go into details, but I've written, I published an article on that and so forth. And which then, of course, established a personal relationship with Kramash. So that there is, yeah, so this is, but this was very important because it shifted the uh, emphasis also inside not just the, the Duma, uh, but also the, uh, the uh, whole composition of the uh, uh, Slavic committees, the so-called Slavic committees, in particular in, in Moscow, where after 1908, you have a separate Slavic committee which is not Pan-Slav. So in other words, this is, and, and also uh, the Guchkov uh, brothers, there were two of them and so forth, uh, tried to steer away from uh, the Pan-Slav uh, ideas uh, before. I mean, there's no time to go into all of this, but this is, this is very well then reflected in what you said. But, you know, the origins are in Moscow, actually, and as a matter of fact, they're always referred to as the Moscow party, even in Russian sources and so forth. So that's the, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is the second paper. I would like to point out that because at the moment I have just finished the book on that and I have to deal with that, is how do you deal with this whole Kiev and Rus business and so forth? Now, without going into very great debates and acrimonious uh, uh, you know, uh, accusations of one kind or another, <coughs> I think certain things must be agreed upon. And the first thing is that we are dealing, back in the 11th century, with a pre-nationalist uh, formation. I wouldn't call it a state, because Kiev and Rus was not an organized state. It had uh, what is known as the uh, step-side uh, uh, succession to the throne. And therefore, uh, there was no primogeniture, but the eldest male succeeded as the Kiev and Rus. Okay? And uh, therefore, we can agree that it wasn't really a state of any kind, but it was the closest that the Eastern Slavs, I would call them, or the East Slavs, came to it. Now, uh, the other thing is that all of the uh, sources are not in later Russian or Ukrainian or whatever. They are in old church Slavonic. Everybody knows this. But of the Eastern redaction. In other words, already they are showing elements of this and so forth. So to argue that, you know, um, the Kiev and Rus was either an exclusively, this is my comment, an exclusively Ukrainian uh, state or embryonic state, or a, later on a Russian embryo, which is even more uh, tangential, because I don't know whether how many of people know about the Pagodin thesis. Everything goes back to the Pagodin thesis, because Mikhail Pagodin is there. Yeah, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, it, it's, it's very, very difficult to get away from this Soviet concept of the common patrimony of all the three stars, because what do you put in there instead is even, in my opinion, more hypothetical. That's what I would like to say. Sorry about taking so long. Next one. Are please. Two short questions, one for Adam. Uh, on which sources uh, did you, did, from which sources did you draw your conclusions about the uh, Slovak uh, journalists not uh, and uh, not being uh, allowed to talk on in the Krakow uh, um, uh, Congress? I'm asking because uh, I know that both the Austrian and the Hungarian uh, uh, governments were very jealous not to allow each other to interfere into what they considered in internal affairs. Uh, that's the one question. The second is, uh, Frank, I, I, this uh, uh, math you showed is just beautiful. My eyesight wasn't good enough. Uh, am I right that the Crimean was considered only partly Slav? We can have a look on. And uh, was the color on the Crimean Ukrainian or Russian? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want wait, wait, wait. Last call, last call. Last call for questions, comments. Now your answers, please. <laughs> yeah. I have a look to the map and you go and answer. 
So thank you, first yes. of all, thank you for your uh, remarks and uh, mm, I would say the um, mm, uh, very interesting uh, observation. Uh, I could only say that uh, in terms of uh, Soviet vision, uh, we should talk about the uh, mm, ideological, uh, very uh, mostly ideological version. And uh, the Soviet historians uh, didn't invent the uh, theory about the uh, Kievan Rus. Uh, it was invented by the uh, 19th imperial Russian historians. Mikhail Pagod. Yes. And it was, I would say, developed uh, due to the uh, Marxist canon and the Stalinist uh, historiography. So, you know, uh, to be honest, we couldn't talk about the Soviet uh, theory. It's kind of, I would say, modernized uh, Russian, 19th uh, century Russian uh, 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 imperial historiography product. May I just add one more thing? No. Yep. Every single textbook published in the West until the 1990s and in some cases beyond on Russia, history of Russia or the Soviet Union, incorporated this imperialist view of uh, you know the Ukraine and all of this. Yep. Every single one, whichever one you you, you know you chose. From this yeah, uh, three things. Just think of for the for the hint to to this personal relationships because they became really important in the moment when Kramash was the head of the Czechoslovak delegation to the Paris Peace Conference, and he was singled out of the the, the, the Czech policy after the first elections, and he started his Russian action in order to bring in Russia into the game because it was excluded due to this Bolshevik uh, revolution. And this ended up in a book which was written in, in Russian and published in Paris. It's even thicker than that one. And it, it was called uh, Ruskia Crisis. And there you find the whole story. So thanks for the hint, because there are all the people. The other thing is, here are the Polish, the <coughs> Slovana. This is for, for our archaeologists archeologi and all this. And this is hard to be seen because they are no Ukrainians. <laughs> they are small Russians. Small Russians, Malorum Sober, and no, nobody knows if that queen or that queen or another queen is unsurpassed. Uh, it should be pointed out that map was made by Lubor Nieder. Yeah. Who's, got, who's got a six volume thing on the slots. And yeah. this is the, yeah. so in other words, yeah, we should so, yeah. if this is the legend which is there initially in order to give you an idea. And Nida he made a career and he became rich. <laughs> so, yes. okay, thank you for your question. Uh, by last three or four years, I uh, organized to learn to all this uh, to all archives in all these cities uh, and I divided my source base so source base to three corps one was police acts the second one was acts of uh, journalistic organization and the third one it was was um, municipal acts or local authorities acts and uh, each Congress, I want to check by these three uh, archives and later read newspaper at the last <laughs> uh, And uh, your question about Slovak, uh, it was a problem on the second Congress, and I found acts of uh, Galician police uh, in Krakow and Lambert, the Lviv book, and uh, the, the head of uh, police uh, in Krakow uh, was corresponding with governor of Lviv and from Lviv there was the, uh, the correspondence with Ministry of Internal uh, Affairs. 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 And there is, uh, this correspondence shows that uh, Austrian authorities didn't give uh, permission to uh, take a voice by Slovak uh, Journalists, but Polish press wrote that it's um, because of uh, inspiration of uh, Hungarian authorities. 
Uh, but it, it was a fact, uh, the Svetozar Urban Vajajski, the most famous Slovak writer this time, came to Krakow and he uh, couldn't uh, talk during this congress. I have a program of this congress, there is his name, there is the title, but he couldn't uh, say anything. Only on bankets. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, will there be any closing remarks or not? Shall we end this? Know. Is it the case of the Slavic Congress without any <laughs> Maybe a manifesto for you. Bravo! <laughs> so, closing remarks. <laughs> uh, I can say, like, uh, our last speaker, Jan Trutsky, in the when he said that he, he would admire the patience of the audience, if I yeah. can say so. And um, I like it very much that there are so many people here at Friday late afternoon and uh, I thank you for your patience all and that you have been a part of this uh, conference. I will now shortly switch to the common Slavic language of the 19th century, <laughs> sometimes was mentioned here, so uh, after which I vielleicht noch ein paar Punkte. Um, ich werde keine inhaltliche Zusammenfassung Nein. machen, dafür ist es erstens so steht. Äh, zweitens äh, muss man sagen, dass wir eine sehr große Bandbreite hier hatten, aber äh, das war nicht beliebig, glaube ich, kann man sagen, dass wir mit diesen drei Schwerpunkten erstens äh, Geschichte bzw. Ereignisse, zweitens äh, Ideen, Anstöße, Impulse und äh, drittens äh, Gedenken, an die Ereignisse von 1848, dass wir, glaube ich, eine ganz gute Struktur damit geschaffen haben und äh, dass das äh, von Anfang an bis heute, bis in die letzten Vorträge sich durchgezogen hat. Vielleicht kurz ein, ein Blick nach vorne, äh, nicht 200 Jahre für die nächste Konferenz, da sind, glaube ich, einige von uns nicht mehr am Leben, die Jüngeren können vielleicht überlegen, ob sie in 25 Jahren so etwas noch mal äh, anpacken, aber äh, die Frage sollte erlaubt sein, was kommt nach dieser Konferenz? Wir haben vorhin kurz darüber gesprochen, ob man das publiziert. Ähm, zum Publizieren gehört Geld und gehört auch Manpower, insofern als ja jemand sich um die Redaktion äh, kümmern muss. Wir werden vielleicht in den nächsten ein, zwei Monaten darüber äh, beraten und dann an die Referenten Nachrichten schicken. Ich glaube sicher, es würde sich lohnen. Wir haben eine ganze Menge von neuen Aspekten hier gehabt, die noch nicht so ausführlich äh, publiziert äh, worden sind. Äh, ein weiterer Aspekt da hinten, Sie haben immer mal die Kamera gesehen, also äh, der Großteil der Vorträge ist äh, aufgenommen worden auf Video. Äh, das wird geschnitten werden in den nächsten Tagen und Wochen und wird demnächst als ein YouTube-Video äh, zur Verfügung stehen. Auch darauf werden wir dann hinweisen. Wir haben ja alle Ihre äh, E-Mail-Adressen, äh, Ihre Kontaktdaten und äh, können Sie darüber äh, informieren. Ähm, weitere Anstöße vielleicht, da will ich noch mal erinnern, ähm, an den Vortrag der beiden Kollegen heute von dem Friedhof der Märzgefallenen. Ähm, man könnte sicher einen, einen viel breiteren europäischen Kontext noch herstellen, als wir das gemacht haben mit unserem Schwerpunkt auf den Slaven. Ähm, man könnte fragen, wie ist das mit der, mit der Öffentlichkeit in Italien, äh, in Frankreich, in Belgien? Äh, wie ist das mit der politischen Memorialisierung äh, des Geschehens von 1848? Aber das ist vielleicht eine Aufgabe, die diese Kollegen in Berlin und äh, bewerkstelligen können, weil es eben da durch politischen Willen die Stiftung auf den Weg gebracht worden ist und äh, sie auch Aufgaben brauchen für die nächsten Jahre. Äh, ich werde da immer mal Kontakt halten und sehen, äh, dass da etwas äh, vorwärts geht. Ähm, damit bin ich auch bei der Zusammenarbeit noch einmal der Institute, die diese Konferenz ermöglicht haben. Ich habe das am Anfang bei der Eröffnung schon darauf hingewiesen und Sie haben das alles auf dem, ähm, auf dem, auf dem Titelblatt der Konferenz äh, natürlich gesehen. Äh, vielleicht noch ein bisschen auch noch in die Zukunft äh, geschaut. 
Maren Röger, meine Nachfolgerin als Direktorin im GWZO, hat darauf hingewiesen, dass das Leipziger Institut äh, weiter aktiv sein wird in Prag. Ähm, ich glaube, da tut sich einiges, um das tatsächlich äh, weiter zu bewerkstelligen, sodass wir diese ohnehin schon existierende Plattform GWZO Prag in Zusammenarbeit mit der Technischen Akademie der Wissenschaften, dass sich das also weiter entwickeln wird und als eine ständige Einrichtung hier in Prag auch tätig sein wird. Und das wird es erleichtern, weiter zusammenzuarbeiten auf verschiedenen Feldern, von der Archäologie bis in die Geschichte der Neuzeit hinein. Dann vielleicht noch Dank. Auch vor allen Dingen, ich sagen, hier an die Villa Lanna, äh, an das Personal. Das hat wunderbar alles äh, funktioniert mit dem Kaffee und äh, Essen und äh, kann ich, glaube ich, wirklich sagen, in diesen wundervollen Räumlichkeiten, wenn sich die Gelegenheit ergibt, sollte man das wiederholen, ohne dass ich jetzt unbedingt dabei sein muss. Aber ich glaube, es wäre für alle äh, prima. Und, äh, Herr Gerlieb hat vorhin den Organisatorinnen und Organisatoren gedankt. Organisatorinnen waren jetzt eher nicht vertreten, so. aber, im Nein. <lacht> aber vielleicht, also jetzt einfach nochmal Philipp Binder, will ich erwähnen, der den Kontakt mit Ihnen angeknüpft und aufrechterhalten hat. Jetzt nur sagen, also wir haben noch einen Programmpunkt morgen. Äh, ja, ja, das, das haben sich, glaube ich, aber das ist angewendet. Ja. Oder vielleicht kannst du also was dazu sagen. Noch zum Programm, also wer, wer Interesse hat, Palatzki und Riegel Wohnung zu besuchen, ungefähr eine Stunde, anderthalb Stunde da zu verbringen, dann kann entweder um 10 Uhr gleich vor der Pforte in Palatzki Gasse stehen, morgen. Oder ungefähr kurz nach neun bin ich da und diejenigen, die Interesse haben, nehme ich mit und wir fahren mit der U-Bahn zum Museum. Also ungefähr kurz nach neun hier in Villola, die Interesse Das ist das Aber ich möchte mich auch bedanken, äh, vor allem bei dir, Christian. Das war eine wunderbare Zusammenarbeit. Die Idee kam von Christian und Realisierung dann ja. gemeinsam. Dafür bedanke ich mich mit diesem Buch, das haben wir geschrieben über Familie Lana und äh, die, die, äh, das Unternehmen von ihr. Äh, ist das äh, tschechisch geschrieben, aber das ist egal, weil die Ikonografie ist die bei weitem wichtiger und die Untertitel sind auf Deutsch auch. Ja. Also dass du weißt, dass du da warst. Ja. Und dann möchte ich mich selbstverständlich auch äh, bei meinen Mitarbeitern nennen. Bedanken, das wurde schon gesagt, für Binder, Pernika, Peschkova. Aber hinter uns stand immer eine Kontrolle. Und das war Frank Hadler. <lacht> also regelmäßig kam er nach Prag. Und in Prager Restaurants haben wir also die Nuancen auch besprochen. Also besten Dank. Dank, dass Sie gekommen sind, dass Sie Ihre Papiere vorbereitet haben. Und vielleicht nächsten Mal also finden wir wieder mal ein gemeinsames Thema und auf Wiedersehen. Ja.